This talk is about cranial nerve examination. Cranial nerves will be discussed in two sessions. During this session, we will talk about cranial nerve 1, 2, 3, 4, and 6. These are the class objectives. You do not need to read them. We will use them to chart our talk. This is a view of the undersurface of the brain. I will use it to show the cranial nerve before we talk about each of them. The first cranial nerve is the olfactory tract. How do we test it? To test the olfactory nerve, we ask the patient to close their eyes and also one nostril. When they do, we give them to smell orange scent, coffee scent, and chocolate scent. If normal, they identify them correctly. If not normal, they either say that they cannot smell them or that all the smells are the same. Is this anosmia? Remember, trust, board, verify. With the patient's eyes still closed, try ammonia. With the bottle far away from their nose, if it is not recognized, then bring the bottle closer. If you can smell it and the patient is still cannot, the patient may be having a bad cold, a mental illness, or faking anosmia. Check the nose. If no cold, see if there is suggestion of mental illness. If not, the patient is likely to be faking anosmia. Non-organic anosmia, whether mental illness or faking, should be referred to a psychiatrist. But remember, non-organic conditions can only be diagnosed once organic conditions are excluded. Why do we think of non-organic anosmia if ammonia is not smelled? Because smelling the scent of orange, coffee, and chocolate uses the olfactory system, whereas smelling ammonia Ammonia, being an irritant, is done using the trigeminal nerve system. On the other hand, if when after smelling orange, coffee, and chocolate scent, you think the patient may have anosmia, and ammonia is identified, you are likely dealing with an organic anosmia. Remember, to check both nostrils because anosmia can be bilateral or unilateral. What conditions can produce bilateral anosmia? Bilateral anosmia have many causes. I will mention three. The most frequent cause of anosmia is a cold. But during periods of COVID, epidemic, COVID will be the most common cause. The second is a test condition. That is a condition you are likely to encounter in a test, but never in real life. This condition is called Kalman syndrome. Kalman syndrome is a genetic condition characterized by impaired sense of smell, that is anosmia, and hypo gonadotropic hypogonadism. This combination is quite rare, so if you see it in a test, and Kalman syndrome is among the possible answers, choose it. The third cause of anosmia I want to mention to you is head trauma. Why head trauma can produce anosmia? This figure shows the olfactory nerve and the cribriform plate. This is a view of a real cribriform plate from above. Notice the little holes here, here, and here. Also notice how thin the actual plate is. 
in the event of head trauma, the thinnest and multiple perforation of the cribriform plate renders it vulnerable to fractures. And when they happen, the olfactory nerve fibers get severed and anosmia occurs. The good thing is that 10 to 38% of patients recover smell because the nerve regrowth back from newly minted neurons. Remember, the olfactory epithelial cells retain their capacity to undergo neurogenesis. This capacity makes them unique. So we have talked about bilateral anosmia. Let's now talk about unilateral anosmia. What conditions can produce unilateral anosmia? I will mention only one cause of unilateral anosmia. This condition is rare, probably as rare as Kalman syndrome, but as Kalman syndrome is often found in exams. As you can see in this MRI, the left nasal passage looks different from the right one. This is because the left cribriform plate is gone, or at least significantly damaged, and the right cribriform plate is present. This is so because of a mass in the left frontal area, as you can see, this mass is infiltrating the left nasal passage and has destroyed some of the left cribriform plate. In the image I have added in this frame, you can see the sagittal extension of the mass and the impact it has on the cribriform plate. The mass is an olfactory groove meningioma. The association of unilateral anosmia and olfactory groove meningioma is called Foster-Kennedy syndrome. After the olfactory nerve, we are going to talk about the optic nerve. The optic nerve is examined by checking visual fields for deficit, inattention, we also evaluate the second cranial nerve by fundoscopy, and we also evaluate acuity. We will first talk about visual fields, specifically about visual field defects. Visual field defects can affect the periphery or the blind spot. We will now address peripheral deficit. How do we test peripheral deficit? By mapping the peripheral field. Here, the examiner is covering the left eye and instructing the patient to cover the, her right eye and to look at his own cover eye. The next question is to ask the patient when she sees the finger. Not always is the finger used to do the testing. As a matter of fact, it is better to use a stick with a red ball. In a perfect world, the stick will be of the same color as the background the patient is looking at. The testing should be done from the periphery to the center. Coming to the middle from the northeast, northwest, southwest, and southeast. What is normal? Visual fields are measured in degrees and minutes. The area of the visual field is limited to 60 degree up by the forehead, to 75 degree down by the cheekbone, to about 60 degree medially by the nose, and to about 100 degrees in the temporal direction by the anatomical configuration of the orbit. After evaluating the peripheral visual fields, we check the blind spot. How do we test for the blind spot? Mapping a normal blind spot is not easy. It is close to impossible unless you are 
and an ophthalmologist's office with special equipment. In a regular neurological exam, to find it, you must move the stick horizontally at the level of the patient's eye while asking the patient to tell you when she no longer sees the red ball in this case. Normally, the blindness spot can be found 1.5 degree below the horizontal meridian and 15 degree temporarily to the site of foveal fixation. The average blindness spot is 7.5 to 5.5 degree in diameter. Why do we have a blind spot? This is a representation of the visual pathways. You can see the optic nerve, the temporal retina, the fovea, the nasal retina, and the optic disc. I have now introduced the visual field corresponding to the left eye and now the right eye. The spots I have introduced in the visual fields are the center of vision, which represent foveal vision. I have now introduced the blind spot. The blind spot is in line with the axis of the optic nerve. It lies on the temporal side of the visual fields. There are no rods or cones at the disc. That is why it is a blind spot. So far, we have been describing normal visual fields. In practice, doctors do not measure the visual field in degrees, but do so by comparing the patient's visual field with their own. It is important to remember that this way of testing is only accurate if the patient and the doctor doing the test are equidistant from the target and the doctor has normal visual fields. What about abnormal visual fields? We will approach abnormal visual fields by giving four examples. The first example, this figure, as I hope you recall, represents normal visual pathways and normal visual fields. Here I have represented left eye monocular vision loss. The purple visual field represents no vision in the left field. Such a finding is likely to be due to an optic nerve injury or damage, as it was in this case. You can see a mass. The mask was an optic nerve glioma. This is another view of the mass, so you can better appreciate the size of the mass. This patient had neurofibromatosis type 1. Neurofibromatosis type 1 is an autosomal dominant condition with 100% penetrance due to mutation of the NF1 tumor suppression gene on chromosome 17. The second example, again, we will start with the representation of normal visual pathways and visual fields. The next frame shows the lateral areas of the visual fields in violet, representing blind areas in both temporal regions. This pattern of visual field abnormality is called bitemporal hemianopsia. Bitemporal hemianopsia is due to optic chiasm compression. Optic chiasm compression can be due to multiple causes, usually tumors, such as pituitary adenoma or craniopharyngioma. This MRI shows a large lesion in the area of the chiasm. This is a coronal view of the same patient. You can see the compression in the region of the optic chiasm and the large tumor which was removed here you can see the characteristic of the removed tumor. It was a craniopharyngioma. 
The third example of visual field defect involves the blind spot. A normal sized blind spot is very difficult to detect as we previously mentioned. Not so an enlarged one. Enlarged blind spot may indicate the presence of papilledema. The fourth visual field abnormality i like to call your attention to is tonal vision. Tonal vision refers to a constrictive visual field that does not expand as the distance from the patient increases, as you can see in this frame. The presence of such a field should raise the possibility of a non-organic field defect. Normally, visual fields expand as the distance from the patient is increased. That is why it is measured in degrees. Organic visual field constrictions, as well as normal visual fields, increase as the distance from the patient increases, as depicted in this frame. In this frame, I have brought the three visual fields I just explained together to make it easier to see the difference between them. It is important to state that the size fixed field suggests a non-organic pathology, but it does not prove it. After visual field defects, we test for visual field inattention. How do we test for visual inattention? Two ways, both are very easy. One is to stand in front of the patient and spread your hands as you see here. Then ask the patient to look straight at you and as he does, wiggle your fingers simultaneously while asking the patient which finger are you moving. The second way to test for inattention is by sitting the patient in front of a paper with a line, as you can see in this frame, and asking the patient to bisect the line right in the middle. If normal, that is, if there is no visual inattention, the patient see both fingers simultaneously. And when asked to bisect the line, the patient should break the line in the middle as indicated here. If abnormal, with the first testing method, when wiggling the fingers and asking the patient which finger are you moving, the patient only identifies one side, let's say the right side. Such an answer should make you think of the possibility of neglect. With the second testing method, when asked to bisect a line, instead of placing the line in the middle of the larger horizontal line, the patient places the line on one side, as in this case. This is so because the patient sees a shorter line as shown in the figure on the right. Because the left side of the horizontal line is being neglected. So for him, the line made by him is in the middle of what he can see. Notice that the caricature is on the right side of the paper and the left side of the figure is incomplete. The caricature and the bisection of the line I show you belong to a patient that had a right stroke, as you can see here and here. This MRI was done one week after the stroke, close to the time the clinical evaluation during which the patient drew the caricature and bisected the line. After checking for inattention, we check fundoscopy. How is fundoscopy tested? The tool for fundoscopy is the ophthalmoscope. Before shining the light of the ophthalmoscope in the patient's eye, 
adjust the focus ring to correct it for your vision. You can do this by placing your hand one to two inches from the ophthalmoscope and adjusting it by moving the focus ring so you can see your hand creases sharply as depicted in this frame. Once this is done, let's say that you want to look at the patient's right eye first, dim the light in the room, ask the patient to look at an object. The object should be rather far to avoid pupillary constriction. Check the ophthalmoscope. Do not make the ophthalmoscope light too bright and make sure you check the setting prior to approaching the patient's eye as we have just mentioned. The initial aim will be for the beam of light from the ophthalmoscope to be at the same horizontal level as the patient's eye and about 15 degrees laterally from the line of fixation as represented here by the blue line. This angle allows good disc visualization for the reason that I will make apparent to you in the next few minutes. The figure I have added corresponds to the back of the eye. The optic nerve, the temporal retina, and the nasal retina, the optic disc, and the macula. The line of the patient's vision is in direct trajectory to the right eye macula in this drawing, as demonstrated by the line I have just added. The 15 degree line, the blue line, is in direct projection with the disc. The disc is the structure we hope to see in the middle of the ophthalmoscope fundoscopic field when we start looking at a disc. Hence, as we approach the ophthalmoscope to the patient from the side, at the time, the line of projection will fall in the nasal retina. But then, as we rotate the ophthalmoscope to reach the line of projection corresponding with the 15 degree line, the fundus with the disc in the center will appear. Once we look at the disc, we move the ophthalmoscope about to visualize the macula. At this point, you will see, if normal, an image similar to this one. In it, you will be able to appreciate the disc here indicated has a sharp temporal side and a less sharp nasal side. It is pink. The overall Contours should be cleared. The cup, that is the lighter part of the disc, should occupy less than 50% of the disc. Venous pulsation should be present. To see venous pulsation, it is at times convenient to look at veins in the periphery and trace it back to the disc. The veins look thicker than the arteries. Spontaneous Retinal venous pulsations are caused by the fluctuating intravascular pressure gradient between the intraocular retinal veins and the retrolaminar portion of the central retinal vein. An increase in the pressure of the retrolaminar portion of the central retinal vein, which occurs with increased intracranial pressure, makes a spontaneous venous pulsation disappear. An increase in the pressure of the intraocular retinal veins may bring about spontaneous retinal venous pulsations. This may be brought about by applying gentle pressure to the eyeball during fundoscopic examination. In this frame, you can see that the macula is a red area, temporal to the disc, the macula is considered the zero meridian, thus in reality we should say that the disc is nasal to the macula. 
the macula fades into the retina, the fovea fades into the macula, the retina is pink, darker than the disc and lighter than the macula. It is important to say before leaving the subject of the normal fundus that in most instances the relation of shades of color is more important to detect retinal pathology than the color themselves. Fundi abnormality come in many forms. We will mention two cases that presented abnormal fundoscopy. The first case I have already mentioned. It is the one with Foster Kennedy syndrome, the one we refer to when talking about anosmia. You can see here a large mass in meningioma. Fundoscopy of the right side, the side of the mass, showed optic atrophy. The color of the optic disc is more pale than expected. Fundoscopy of the left eye showed race and blurry disc margin consistent with papilledema. Notice that the margins of the disc are blurred and the edges are raised. The second case consists of a very dramatic fundus. You can see a large segment of the retina is yellow or white. This fundi corresponds to this patient. The white area, the tumor, is visible following pupillary dilatation as you can see in this frame. This lesion corresponds to a retinoblastoma. Having done fundoscopy, we move to acuity. Acuity should be tested with the patients using corrective glasses if appropriate. Testing can be done using Snellen chart, but most neurologists, especially in the ward, use the Rosenbaum screener card. This car has a line for 2020 vision, which is normal, and another one for 2050 vision, which is poor vision. How do you use the Rosenbaum screener? You place the card 14 inches from the patient's eye and instruct the patient to read starting from the bottom where the 2020 vision is and go up if necessary. If normal, the 2020 line will be read correctly. If abnormal, the line will not be read correctly or just the patient will say that they cannot read it. Then the question arises if poor vision is neurological or ophthalmological. That is, if it is from a neurological problem or an ophthalmological problem. The distinction can be made using pinhole glasses. These glasses have the capacity to alternate blocking one side or another. In this case, the right pinhole is open. When used in a patient that was not able to read the 2020 line and now with the glasses is able to do so, as portrayed here, the problem is not neurological. The patient may need glasses. If, on the other hand, vision is not better with the glasses, then it is a neurological problem. So we have done cranial nerve one and two. Now I would like to, to ask you two questions about subjects that we have already talked about. The first one, this visual field deficit is characteristic of A or B. Think about it for a few seconds, okay? And I hope you all answered A. Now, the second question. A patient unable to smell orange, coffee, and chocolate, 
but is able to smell ammonia is likely to be faking anosmia or having a true anosmia? The answer is B. So now that we have done cranial nerve 1 and 2 and answered two questions, will be a good time for you to take a break. Otherwise, we'll go on with other cranial nerves. And the cranial nerves that we're going to study will be the oculomotor nerve, which is number 3, the trochlear, which is number 4, and the abducen, which is 6. These three nerves are evaluated simultaneously. The evaluation of these three nerves will take a large part of the cranial nerve examination. We start with eyelid examination. How do we test eyelids? By observation. If normal, when the eyes are looking straight ahead, the distance between the upper limbus and the lower edge of the upper eyelid in one eye, as you can see here, is the same as in the other eye. This is normal. The same goes for the amount of white between the iris and the lower lid. They are, as you can see here, the same. A situation that is completely normal. If abnormal, as in this patient, when you look at the upper eyelid, you see significant ptosis. I have enlarged the eye area in this frame so you can better appreciate the relation between the upper eyelid and the iris on the affected side and on the normal side. But also, I want you to focus in the lower area. Notice that in this area, the amount of white is the same as in the abnormal eye, as I have indicated in this frame, and further illustrated here. This constellation of findings, upper eyelid ptosis with equal white at the lower pole, indicates that the ptosis is due to weakness of the levator papillary superioris, the ptosis in this patient is due to myasthenia gravis. In this new frame, I have introduced the photograph of another patient with ptosis. And now I have enlarged the area of the eyes as I did in the other patient. You can see the white here, but not here. This is characteristic of ptosis due to failure of the sympathetic nerves innervating the tarsal or Mueller muscles, as seen in Horner syndrome. Now a question. Which of the figures below is consistent with the Horner syndrome? Take a few minutes to look at each figure. Notice the position of the white in each figure. Check the muscles. The orbicularis oculi is the muscle that closes the eye. Notice the position of the levator palpebrae in each figure and the muscle of Mueller. The answer to this question is C. We have finished talking about eyelids and we will talk now about eye movements. The tests conducted at this point are directed to evaluate extraocular muscles, the extraocular movement cranial nerves and their nuclei, as well as the internuclear connections between these nuclei. How do we test eye movements? By observing the range of eye movement in the patient. You ask the patient to look at your hand in six positions to attempt to activate the six muscles that move the eye as independently as possible. To check the right lateral rectus, 
you ask the patient to look to the right. Looking to the right is achieved by contraction of the lateral rectus, innervated by the abducens. When looking at the left, the right eye uses the medial rectus, innervated by the common oculomotor nerve. To look down and out, the right eye uses the inferior rectus, innervated by the common oculomotor nerve. To look up and to the right, the right eye uses the superior rectus, innervated by the common oculomotor nerve. When looking down and in, the right eye uses the superior oblique, innervated by the trochlear, and when looking up and in, the right eye uses the inferior oblique, which is innervated by the common oculomotor nerve. Now I am bringing the pneumonic master to help you remember what eye muscles do. The pneumonic master will give you three tips. Tip number one. Rectus means straight, thus honest. Hence all muscles named rectus do as they say. So the superior rectus looks up and the inferior rectus looks down and so on. Oblique is a person that does not speak the truth. So any muscle named oblique does the opposite of what they say. So the superior oblique looks down and the inferior oblique looks up. The second rule, the obliques move the eyes when in, the recti move the eyes when out. As you can see depicted in this frame. The third mnemonic rule refers to intorsion and extorsion. Intorsion means rotating the top of the eye towards the nose. Extorsion means rotating the top of the eye towards the ipsilateral ear. The way I remember the muscles that intort the eye is by thinking of the word C, that means yes in Spanish. Muscle label superior turn the eye in towards the nose. Muscles label inferior turn the eyes out towards the ears. This mnemonic rule is summarized in this frame. Take a few seconds to look at it. Look at the little arrows coming out of the big arrow for the function of the muscle listed below. The stars indicate that the most powerful torsors. So if extraocular movements are normal, we find that all six muscles have a full range of motion. This indicates that extraocular muscles, cranial nerve, nuclei, and nerves, and their interconnections are working well. If they are not normal, many scenarios may arise. I will tell you about two patients with similar scenario, but with two very different conditions. The first patient is this little lady that is attempting to look to the left, towards the heart. The right eye is looking in the correct direction. The left one is not. This is the line of vision of the right eye. The left eye has a different line of vision. I have now added the eyeballs with the muscles so you can see the movements as we have done in the past. The white line in the red arrow indicates the limitation. So there is weakness of the left lateral rectus. This patient had myasthenia gravis. 
The second patient is this little child. Here I am indicating the left eye. As you can see, the amount of white here is more than, than on the right. I am again introducing the eyeball with the muscles to illustrate the deficit that, as you know, is in the, involves the lateral rectus. The fundi in this patient showed papilledema. The patient had pseudotumor cerebri. After evaluating the range of eye movements, confirming that extraocular muscles, cranial nerve nuclei, and nerves and their interconnections are working well, or finding that they are not working well, we attempt to determine if the different structures controlling extraocular eye movements are working well. We start by looking at saccadic movements, that is, at fast movements from one side to the other with no visualization in between. These saccades are generated by special areas in the frontal cortex. Saccadic movements can be horizontal, that is lateral, or vertical, that is up and down. Let's first look at horizontal movements. The method to test lateral saccadic eye movements and normal eye movements will be addressed simultaneously. You hold two objects, let's say two pencils about 30 centimeters away from the patient and ask the patient to look from one to the other without moving his head. You will see a smooth saccades towards one side and then towards the other. If abnormal, you are likely to see one of the following two possibilities. One possibility is that your instructions in a willing patient to look from one pencil to the other are not followed. The second possibility is that the patient moves his eyes in one direction but is unable to look at the other side and therefore gets stuck in the original site he looked at. After evaluating lateral saccadic movements, you should evaluate vertical saccadic movements. Again, we will address how the test is performed and the normal findings simultaneously. The patient is given the same instruction, but this time the pencils are placed up and down as you see in this frame. A normal patient looks up and then down and then up again without any difficulties. If abnormal, two likely possibilities occur. The first one, you see no movements despite the patient willingness to do so. The second possibility is when you instruct the patient to look from one to the other pencil, the patient looks down but is unable to look up. Inability to look up is often seen in patients with pineal tumors, in this case a teratoma. The tumor compressed eye movement structures in the quadrigeminal plate and surrounding areas which command up and down eye movements. This is called Parinaut syndrome. After voluntary saccadic movements, we will address voluntary pursuit. Pursuit implies fixation and tracking of an object. Pursuit eye movements can be horizontal, that is lateral, or they can be vertical, that is up and down. We will first address lateral pursuit eye movements. Again, we will talk about how to evaluate these movements and 
normalcy simultaneously. You instruct the patient to follow the pencil and do not move his head. Place the pencil relatively close to the patient. Then you move the pencil slowly to one side until the eyes are at most lateral positions. If abnormal, when the patient looks at one side, is able to follow initially, but then there is no further follow through, and the eyes stay in mid position. After lateral pursuit, we check vertical pursuit. Again, I will describe the procedure in normalcy simultaneously. The patient is again instructed to follow the pencil and not to move the head. The pencil is first placed up, then you move it down slowly, all the way down, and then up again to the initial position. If abnormal, the patient looks down, then as you raise it up a short distance, the patient follows the pencil, but as you continue raising it, the patient is no longer able to follow it up, and the eyes remain stuck. Inability to pursue up, same as inability to suck it up, is called Parinal syndrome. They both may result from compression of the quadrigeminal plate and surrounding structures. After pursuit, we check vestibular function. This can be done using three methods. We will explain how to do them in normalcy simultaneously. One way we can evaluate vestibular function is by asking the patient to look at a relatively distant point and to allow you to move his head. Then the head is moved to the right and then to the left. The eyes should be kept looking at the target throughout the movement. The same then is done up and down. The results should be the same. If abnormal, as the head is turned, so do the eyes. And then they return to target slowly. The second method is by triggering the optokinetic reflex. This test is performed by standing in front of the patient and asking the patient to look at the same red square. As you move the strip to one side, let's say to the right, as you move the strip to the right as previously mentioned, the patient's eyes move slowly in that direction, pursuing the target. When they reach the end, then they saccade in the opposite direction, bringing the eyes to the midpoint. The saccade is triggered by vestibular reflex action, unlike the saccades that occur during voluntary saccadic testing to which we alluded earlier. If abnormal, we usually find one of two possibilities. The first one is lack of pursuit, so the eyes do not move. This implies cortical dysfunction, the same as lack of voluntary pursuit. The second possibility occurs after pursuit is achieved. Pursuit takes place normally to the end, but there is a lack of saccade. The lack of saccade indicates vestibular problems. The third method of testing oculovestibular function is by using cold or warm water. This test is usually not done in the awake patient, 
but if it is ever done, make sure that the tympanic membrane is not perforated and that you use a soft rubber needle and not a hard needle to introduce the water in the ear canal. I will talk to you about this method in the future, hopefully. After vestibular mediated eye movements, we check convergence. How is this test performed and normalcy will be addressed simultaneously. You start by instructing the patient to look at your nose. As you approach an object to the patient's face, let's say the object is a little Eiffel Tower. Once the object is closed, you ask the patient to look at the object. Immediately, the patient will see double. But as they converge, the image will become one, although blurry. This blurry view will be corrected when the pupils contract. At that point, the object will become in focus, not only because of the constriction of the pupil, but because of the changes in the lens. That is accommodation. So we can say that eyeballs converge, pupils accommodate, and lens adapt to produce sharpened up close figures. Why is testing convergence important? Testing convergence is of great importance to distinguish a lesion producing medial rectal dysfunction due to third nerve palsy at P in this frame from a lesion in the medial longitudinal fascicle fibers that communicate the sixth cranial nerve with the third cranial nerve motor nuclei at A in this frame because reliance on regular eye movement testing will not allow the distinction since both produce the same ocular findings during this test. Yet normal Convergence, as shown in this frame, localizes the lesion at the medial longitudinal fascicle. After testing convergence, we do the cover test. We will approach this test as we have done others. We will explain how it is done in normalcy simultaneously. You place your hand in front of the patient and instruct the patient to look at it. Then you cover the left eye, wait for a few seconds, and then cover the right eye. And then bring the cover back to the left eye. Normally, the uncovered eye should not move. If abnormal, once you uncover an eye, the eye left on cover will move from being laterally placed usually towards the mid position as you have seen in these few frames. This implies congenital strabismus affecting the left eye. After the cover test we check the pupil for size and position. We tested by observation. Normally, the pupils are equal in mid position. Abnormal pupils are unequal and not centered. After pupillary size and position, we check reaction to light. How is this done and, and what is normal will be explained simultaneously. The patient is asked to look straight ahead. Each pupil is approached with ophthalmoscope off, asking the patient not to look at the ophthalmoscope. Then when 
you are close to the pupils, the light is turned on. As the light falls in one pupil, both pupils should contract and enlarge when the light is removed. Then the same thing is done in the other eye. Both pupils should contract equally. Abnormal responses to light come in two forms. One abnormality is primarily seen in optic nerve pathology as represented here. Light shine in the right eye produces no contraction in either eye. If we change the ophthalmoscope to the other side and shine the light on the left eye, both pupils contract. This is called a relative afferent pupillary defect or Marcus Gone pupil. Marcus Gone pupil can also be seen with extensive unilateral retinal disease. The second abnormal pupil encounter when checking pupillary reaction to light occurs when the third cranial nerve, the oculomotor nerve, is affected. The oculomotor nerve carries parasympathetic fibers. These fibers are in larger stretch of the nerve at its superior border as illustrated in this frame. These parasympathetic fibers innervate the pupil contractor and are responsible for light mediated meiosis. When the right parasympathetic fibers are injured, as illustrated here, shining a light in the right eye produces meiosis in the left eye. So the left pupil reacts, but not the right pupil. If we go to the left eye, that is to the other eye, and shine a light on it, the left pupil will contract, hence reacts, but no reaction will be seen in the right pupil. After reaction to light, we check accommodation. How is accommodation examined? By one of two methods. The first one is similar to the one we use to check conversion. You ask the patient to look at your nose and then to an object as you approach an object to the patient's face. Normally, the patient will see double until convergence occurred and the object, in this case, the miniature Eiffel Tower becomes one, but it will be out of focus. This is followed by meiosis, that is, that is pupillary accommodation and changes in the shape of the lens that will achieve sharpness. So the figure will co become in focus. The second method to test pupillary accommodation is by asking the patient to look at the tip of your finger and approach it. Normally, as you approach the finger to the root of the nose, the eyes will converge and the pupils contract. If pupils are abnormal, as the finger approaches, the eyes converge, but the pupils do not accommodate. There is no meiosis. What is the name of the condition where pupils accommodate to an approaching object but do not react to light? They are called Argyll Robertson pupils, ARP. You are likely to find this pupils in exams, but never in a patient. Yet it is easy to remember 
by playing a game with the first letters in the name of this condition. As you can see, I will first highlight each of these letters. The A here in aqua, the R yellow, and the P in magenta. Here you find the first letter of each word, which I have color match with the ones in the name itself. The arrangement of this letter makes things easy to remember. ARP going forward stands for accommodation, reflect, present. But if read in the opposite direction, they can read pupillary, reflect, absent. These are the clinical manifestation of Argyle Robinson pupils. Accommodation reflex present, pupillary reflex absent. So Argyle Robertson pupils accommodate but do not react. This condition occurs in patients with tertiary syphilis. Here you can see the spiroquet, Traponema pallidium, in a dark field. Now I would like to ask two questions. The first question, falling while walking downstairs likely due to cranial nerve dash deficit, A, 3, B, 4, C, 5, D, Six. The answer is B. The action of both superior obliques are needed to look to your feet as you walk downstairs. The next question, that is question number two, pursued eye movements. As shown in this figure, is seen with A, or B? The answer is A. This patient is unable to look up, which is characteristic of Parinaud syndrome. Thank you very much for your attention.